Welcome to the Property Experts Podcast, where you'll find open conversations, no bullshit attitudes, and deep dive insights from award-winning property developers and business owners, Ben Richards and Jack Jiggins. Together, they've delivered over 40 million in gross development value over the last five years and have a pipeline of over 25 million to deliver in the next 18 months. They've built numerous other seven-figure businesses with six-figure net profits around their property ecosystem, and it's by no means been an easy ride. So on this podcast, they'll share their weekly trials and tribulations running multiple businesses, giving you never before seen insights into the inner workings of finding, funding, designing, delivering and selling award winning property deals together with golden nuggets of advice through the five key areas of any business, marketing, sales, operations, finance and talent. If you're a young entrepreneur looking to get started or have a small team, but you're looking to scale your business to the next level, this is the no bullshit podcast for you. Good afternoon. We are live because it's five o'clock on a Friday. Welcome to the uh, Property Experts podcast or show, depending on what you're listening on. If you're on YouTube, then it'll be the show. If you are listening on the podcast, then it'll be the podcast. But um, welcome to all newbies and people that join us on a regular basis. Um, We're here every Friday. Um, We're here to help you grow your property development business and other associated businesses around that. We've grown six, seven and eight figure businesses over the last uh, six or seven years and i'd like to think that we know what we're talking about in certain certain circumstances so we've got a jam-packed episode as always um some really exciting and cool topics very varied this week so we hope you enjoy it and then we've got a lot of questions at the end to run through um from instagram from last week and from other places if you want to ask a question throughout this drop it in the comments below and uh we will try and um, attack it as soon as we can so on the agenda today, we are looking at um, ENPS, um, that stands for Net Promoter Score. What is it and why is it important for all your companies? We are raising money again for charity and we're going to be talking about our 61 kilometer kayak. Frustrations with utilities. Um, this is one of mine this week because I am losing the will to live with utility providers and dealing with them. And I'm, I'm going to be giving you my top tips on how to approach that process. Jack's been away this week, so he's going to be discussing some of the thoughts he's had on working um, during during holiday, as it's holiday season. Why we do these live videos, so a little bit of a, a rundown as to why. We get asked this a lot, like, why are you bothering spending two hours a week you know, on these calls, doing these, these podcasts and live recordings? And um, we're going to be spitballing a few things um, as to why. Email hacks. Uh, Jack is the king of all hacks. And if you haven't checked out his Jack's Hacks, videos on YouTube, head over there. Um, I think we've got quite a few banks ready to um, ready to record. Um, we had a bit of a pause on them, but I'd like to, to try and get those back up and running because there's some absolute corkers in there about productivity hacks, how to uh, be more productive and more efficient. And hope that you'll learn um, some new tips and tricks to use in your businesses and personal life. Setting up your development tracking for success. I've learned a lot this week. We had a really good conversation at the developer club. Um, with all of the other developers in the group and um, we are pivoting and, and sort of improving our process and I'd like to share the learnings that, that we've made there and like I said we've got plenty of questions that we are going to be running through so welcome if you are just joining us. Jack you want to give a quick intro yeah, to this? Yeah. yeah of course so hello everyone good evening um, looking forward to engaging and let, yeah let's get some questions in while we're uh, while we're recording because that's the whole reason we do it live so you can ask questions live that are burning uh, and taking up space in your head without a answer and hopefully we'll be able to answer it and we would like a challenge so any question asked will get answered um so EMPS stands for employee net promoter score and we run a group of businesses um and we decided to put this uh, assessment out which is commonly used actually in larger companies but we feel as we're growing and as we you know bring new people into the team and have new ways of working or even have existing ways of working that might be outdated we want our employees to communicate with us as freely and openly as possible but sometimes you just telling them that they can do that or that the door is always open isn't quite enough to drive the real root of problems root of issues or even employee day-to-day happiness out of that situation so the ENPS so again that's employee net promoter score is a anonymous assessment that you give to your whole team, asks them a series 
of questions, which you can probably guess what they will sound like. So it's like, would you recommend working for the company to someone else? Do you feel like you're progressing in your job role? Do you feel valued in your job role? What would you uh, look for to potentially look to move businesses if you, that was a thing? And it's trying to drive um, the sort of, I suppose, issues that an employee may have in your business so that you can iron them out without them knowing it, you knowing it's them and them knowing that they're going to find out that it was them that wrote those comments. So I think we had about 12 submissions across the 15 that we have in Central Suites, XP Property and XP Surveys. Obviously, Ben's got a team that's actually a similar size just in Aura alone. But it's to drive change. It's for us to you know, put our hands up and accept criticism and drive change into our business in the areas that is really, really important, which is the team, which are going to help us achieve the goals that we collectively agree into the businesses. Um, so we did carry this out. We were really, really pleased with the scores. Essentially, you know, the, 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 the majority of the team came back very positive about Yes, we are a growing business, but we do quarterly reviews, which keeps everyone on date. Uh, the biggest complaint actually was our office space, even though it's in a phenomenal location and really good place to be for you know shops and Henley's a lovely place to be in. It's just too small. So the footprint that we have is not enough. But uh, spoiler alert, we are actually expanding office space and that is already wheels in motion. So hopefully actually uh, we'll be crossing that one out of uh, the employee score. But that's an example. People saying... They get easily distracted in the office because there's just too uh, too many people in too little space. Uh, and we completely agree it's not cohesive to be in the office when it's a busy day because it is too small. But that's an example of something that might happen in the EMPS score. And then you can actually make a physical change uh, if you have a group or even more, you know, one or more people that make that complaint. Uh, obviously, it's down to the director's discretion and some things you might actually disagree with, but it's the opportunity to understand you know, a free stab where an employee is going, they're not going to know this is me. Here's my formal complaint uh, and what would make this company and job and team and environment better and more, you know, make my day to day more happy. And then you can act on it. So just to give you a, uh, an indication, the main indicator is how they would promote your business. So anything below a six is called a detractor. Um, so someone that is probably speaking negatively about your business uh, when you're when you're not in presence. And then it goes into neutrals, people that are comfortable there and like the space. That's a seven or an eight out of 10. And then a promoter is a nine or a 10, which is where they would recommend working for the business to someone else. Um, so our average score was actually in the promoter uh, green space, which is really, really good. Um, and what is also really important for anyone listening, if you're struggling to recruit or get an employee onboarding uh, in the recruitment process, it's also good to share this with the employees because we always tell, uh, you know, prospective people that we're interviewing that the, t the people in the team enjoy the team the most uh, and the environment. But if you actually have a clinical data point like an MPS score, is really really valuable to share that in the interview process as well. Anything I missed, Ben? No, bang on. Um, I think the amount of times that we've talked about the team being one of the most important things in your business, you know, it, it's almost every week we're saying something similar, and, and it's. Great to see that our teams are um, you know, a, a net promoter of our business, and are, I think it's, it's fundamental to, like Jack says, driving forward in the right direction. Um, and if you've got a happy team, it's more likely to get you to the places that you want to go as an individual business owner. So you know, they're the ones generally day to day uh, pushing things forward, operating the business, generating the, the revenue, the profit margins. So you know, why wouldn't you want to keep those those people happy? So yeah, I think it's a great thing to be doing. Like Jack says, it's a something that a lot of big corporates do, but there's absolutely no reason why small businesses like us shouldn't be doing this type of thing. Um, I think there's so much that I've learned from bigger corporates that I then bring into to Aura, to XPS, to XPP. You know, um, to uh, you know, if if they're doing it, there's a reason for it. It's because it's a great thing to do, and why wouldn't you do it as a small business? So yeah, think about it in your business if you want some intros into. Um, the spreadsheets that we've been using to gather this information, the Google Forms and what it's all about, then drop us a comment below or, or direct message us. But um, yeah, e ENPS, um, take it from us, use it and improve your business going forward. Cool. Um, some of the other things that we do to uh, retain good people, you know, a lot of good people want to be involved in the business and they want social events. They want to be getting involved in extracurricular stuff, exactly like our charity kayak. 
So we did it last year. Um, this year on the 30th of August, we will be kayaking down the River Thames from Abingdon on Thames to Henley on Thames, uh, which is 61 kilometers. Uh, I think we've got about 16 of us um, signed up, um, yeah. 12 to 16 of us signed up. We've got two kayaks, which you can see uh, in the picture, which have been delivered today. Um, we did it last year. To rent the kayaks was almost um, the cost of actually buying them. So uh, we've ended up buying a couple of kayaks. And next Friday, we will be out on the river. It was a gorgeously sunny day last year. We're hoping for something similar again. And it's a different team, well, part, part of a different team. So a lot of newbies that are going to be doing with doing it with us. We're trying to raise at least £2,000. That's our first target. Last year, that was our target. And we absolutely smashed it within a number of weeks. And we ended up achieving almost £10,000. So it's for a very, very worthy cause. It's for the charity Mind, which is all about um, mental health awareness. And if you are, if you would be so kind as to donate, we will put the link in the description down below. It's it's on our Just Giving page, and we'd love to raise as much money as possible for Mind. Yeah, I just wanted to touch on the we. So last year we actually donated to uh, what you could call the Mind Original Group Charity, which is purely focused on every facet of what mind support we've decided to um go more locally on this on this occasion so it's actually mind oxfordshire um so not only do they provide care and assistance for people uh, that are struggling with mental health but also housing uh, which we thought was very apt given the business that we're in we provide private housing uh, and private purchases and private rentals uh, and we're hopefully you know supporting the the, the less fortunate that can't live in our you know, shared HMO or whatever it may be. Um, but super excited for it. Ben, I've actually just checked the weather and it looks to be like we're in luck, um, nice. which is good news. Um, <laughs> good. I, I was thinking, you know, we did it last year and, and it was such a good day to then be wading through uh, tornadoes and wet weather would certainly put a damper on things. But, you know, it is what it is. We'll do it regardless. Um, it should, for those that are interested, take us about 12 hours. It did last year, um, slightly less than that. So we we hope to be back in by dark again, and yeah, please donate uh, generously. Yeah, just want to shout out to Harry Harry Stevenson Clark. Thanks very much for your donation. We I saw that come in, very much yes. appreciated. And the reason that he's uh, this is this is his first live at five is because he actually lives in New Zealand. So thank you very much, Harry. Really appreciate it. Yeah, thank you very much. It's a, a, a great cause, very very close to my my heart. Onto something that is uh, less fun, um, and that is frustrations with uh, utilities, and that means utilities connections. So I'm sure those of you that are property developers listening to, into this will understand the sheer pain and and the, the banging your head against the brick wall for uh, you know working with utility providers, the time it takes, the the lack of understanding or pragmatism is unbelievable. Um, but I'm going to be trying to help you avoid some of those disappointments um, by giving you some of the, the sort of top tips and things that I've learned throughout this process to help you uh, ride the wave a little bit smoother. So first one I've got on my list is to prepare early. You, know, you, you can never prepare early enough for uh, making utilities applications. Um, get them in as soon as you've purchased the site uh, because it is the sort of thing that can hold things up. We had Thames Water uh, waste 13 months of our time, delay and cause two sales to fall out of bed on our Princess Risper scheme last year um, because the water connections weren't weren't made in good time. So I'd say Thames Water is probably the worst, but yeah, the sooner you can get your applications in, the better. Um, and that isn't just getting the applications in, that's making payments because typically they don't do anything until they've received payments for things. With Thames Water, they often want staged inspection. So uh, once you've made the payment and you've got the design, they will um, ask you to provide and install the pipework from your site to the boundary. And then at that point, they will want to do a water regulations inspection. And then only when that has been signed off, will they then start coordinating the connections to the, the, the mains water. And that process is painful because they've then got to liaise with the local council to get permits to do the works. They might have to organize traffic management. And none of that process starts until the water regulations inspection has been signed off. Um, so get your applications in early, make payments on time, respond in good time, and uh, you're, you're going to help yourselves in the long run. 
One thing I've learned this week is that certainly uh, UKPN, who's one of our electric electricity providers on one of our sites, what you would hope would happen is that you submit a plan, you, they look at it, and they say, look, that doesn't work for us. This isn't compliant. That isn't compliant. You don't have access here. Um, and they turn around and they say, why don't you do this? Um, but that's not how it works. You submit a plan. They say, no, that doesn't work. And they say, send us a new one. So <laughs> you're basically second guessing what they do or don't want. Um, we are, I think, three three iterations now in with, with UKPN. Um, we've now changed tact completely. We're trying to bring the electricity in from a completely separate entity, a completely separate route. But we're having to send that to them to say, does this work? Instead of them coming, them coming to us and saying, why don't you do X? Because that would work for X, Y, and Z. So extremely frustrating. What I think I'm going to be doing going forward is saying, here's three options. Please review all three and then come back with us, come back to us with your preferred option. That way you're kind of cutting out the delays because what normally happens is you submit an, app, submit an app, application with drawings, takes them three weeks to get back to you to say that, no, this doesn't work. Then you have to submit something else. It takes another three weeks and you're just back and forth constantly. So if you can provide options for um, these providers, um, it's going to sort of double or triple your chances of finding a solution that works for both parties. Challenge everything is my third tip with utilities, both challenge the costs and also challenge, you know, like the UKPN offering that I've just talked about, they came back to us with a solution, but it was basically digging up about 100 meters of land that we don't own to a place that we don't even need to make a connection to. Um, so those sorts of things are very clearly an obvious items to just challenge and say, look, this, this isn't going to work. This doesn't work for us. It may work for you, but it doesn't work for us. So challenging the price, challenging their design when it comes in. And uh, yeah, that's, that's challenge, basically. We've been using utilities consultants, and I would highly recommend doing that to take on the coordination of utilities yourself. We've done it. I don't like doing it because it saps so much time and energy by bringing in a utilities consultant hopefully the people that you use and we've had bad ones to be fair but hopefully the one the good ones that you do use understand the process far better they can help you streamline the process more so uh, and they've actually saved us a lot of money in the past so this this challenging that i'm talking about in point number three is great and if you understand the process you can challenge things that are really obvious but there have been times where our utilities consultant has, have challenged things that i wouldn't think of challenging um, and saved us you know a re remarkable amount remarkable amount of, amount of money actually so use external consultants. Some of those external consultants know third-party installers that can actually take on the installation and save you costs for the actual connection works. Um, and this is only really relevant for, for big, big lumps. So if you're looking at 100, 150, 200 grand's worth of work, there will be some installers out there that can save you a lot of money by coordinating and installing all of the works as part of their, um, their scope. So maybe doing the gas and the electric connections and the water connections all under one roof, you know, digging similar same trenches and sort of saving all of those individual markups on individual processes and timelines by bringing it all in one house to a third party construction installer. And then uh, something that we've come across recently with some utilities, they are going to want easements, which is a, a legal kind of right for them to put a gas pipe within your land, for example, and if they need to dig it up or do some replacement works, they have a legal right to enter site and and do such works. And that's effectively all it is, but it's just another cost for you. You know, you've got uh, solicitors that are going to have to deal with this back and forth. It might cost you a couple of grand to, to put that in place. You might have external investors that you're working with that are party to the land title. They have to then agree to the easements as well. They might have um, solicitor costs to kind of coordinate that process. So it's it's a faff and it's an extra cost. And sometimes, you know, if you don't know that it might be possible, it's a cost that you might not have budgeted for or um, you know contingency that you don't really want to be using. So watch out for easements, um, but they are they are very common. And we we have recently pushed back on some of the standard terms within the the um, gas suppliers legal agreements whereby you know we clearly have a gate that sat along the line of the, um, the the connections that are coming in if we wanted to replace that gate we would have to get get the gas um, 
supplier's approval to do that, which is ludicrous on our own land. So we had our solicitor push back on the wording that said that that needs to happen. So yeah, if you've got a good solicitor, you need to make sure that they are pushing back on some of the um, the points that these easements try to make you do. But hopefully that was sort of useful for some of you that are going into property development and haven't really understood or gone through the utilities process. It is very slow, very convoluted, very painful, um, but hopefully those tips will help give you a bit of a head start. Cool. And for, for extra tips like that, we are growing in our XP boardroom. Um, we've had a, a couple of new starters recently, which is amazing. We've got our face-to-face boardroom session early next month, I believe, um, in, yeah. in Clapham in London. And this is for people that want to scale their, their property business. You know, maybe they're just starting out, done a couple of HMOs or want to start in development. Um, want to know how to start and run a successful property business around just doing individual pr- profitable projects. Um, so if you're interested in learning from from Jack and I um, and the shared knowledge and shared contacts within the room, comment boardroom below or DM us or email info at xpproperty.co.uk. Cool. Holiday working. Holiday working. Yeah, we don't need to spend too long on this, but yeah, it might be a secret to all of you, but I spent the last week in Cornwall with family and dogs and food and booze and whatever you want to call it. But it was uh, all really good fun in an Airbnb overlooking some fields with some cows and it. it was lovely. My intention was to try and actually get some time away from the desk because we've got a PA now. We've not really got any you know, live acquisitions that need driving forward other than one particular site, which we have exchanged on. And it fundamentally, you know, there was a point in the middle of the holiday where I felt like I needed to do a day's work because then I could relax a little bit more than I was. So it's just to put it out there to say sometimes you do need to you know, stay back, hunker down on some emails and catch up with a few things. A bit more firefighting. You know, I wouldn't say do it for respite just to get to crunch your emails through. But to, sometimes there is firefighting. And as a business owner, that is to be expected. And there was actually a poll um, that was shared with me, which was what, what CEOs spend most of their time on. I think something like 90% of uh, a business owner or CEO's time is actually spent on firefighting problems because they are things that are not routine elements that come into the business and don't necessarily have a person that deals with those things. And I'm not talking about, you know, the toilet's blocked. Uh, That should be an office manager's role. I'm talking about a big problem where you've got a big financial problem where something's moved or changed and you need to dive in and give it the time and the attention that it needs and deserves. And sometimes you've got to accept that that might fall during a period where you're supposed to be taking time off and just deal with it. And quite frankly, it's just to say that. And, you know, it's okay to, if you are off for a week, to do a day on your emails or getting stuff done, making phone calls to drive the business forward or to resolve problems that you might need to resolve. Definitely don't be in the sorting office with your emails and being, you know, fielding things X, Y, and Z and dealing with booking in a meeting for next week. But definitely the sort of really high value tasks or high risk tasks, it's okay to just actually get on with them. That was it. Did you did you have any eureka moments? Any moments where you're like, that's a really good idea, this headspace away from emails and stuff um, be on X, Y, and Z? No, not not necessarily I know I know where you're getting at, like the, the clarity moments where you are relaxing and you do think of things slightly differently. I wouldn't have said I right, because the only times I really had away from the office, the the desk, I was actually playing golf and really trying to work on my golf game when you can't really, you don't really have time for other things. So yeah, I was because I was I was in company. You know, I think it's a bit different if you go away as a couple and you have a bit of downtime because you know you don't need to talk permanently to each other. Um, but because you're away with family, there's always things to be talking about. So not necessarily. Yeah. I mean, we we had a, a friend of mine who who you know George Biffin came down and we had some eureka moments doing a bit of business coaching with him around his business, which was quite fun, you know, like looking under the bonnet of his business where it's at. He's actually, you know, in the classic restaurant phase where like number two outlet or just keep it number one and be a, you know, a, 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 I suppose a higher margin business or then you go into scale. Um, so that was really fun looking under the bonnet of his business and I found that fascinating. But generally not necessarily... Yeah, yeah, the firefighting that I was doing was not headspace firefighting. It was sorting out cash flow problems. So yeah. <laughs> not fun. <laughs> Fair. I mean, it's, I asked the question because it is what I find when I go on holiday. Often, if I can properly relax by a pool or, like you say, in the downtime, I often get 
know, the best ideas that, that sort of don't necessarily come to me when I'm busy running around like a madman. It's those sort yeah. of like, yeah, yeah, I did. I did actually have one. I did actually have one quite good one. I got an email from a Central Suites investor asking about timeframes on a couple of investments that we've got coming up, two projects that we're buying, and because I was out of the office and thinking slightly differently, there's a deal that we are buying, which is I think has got an element of risk around the gross development value of it, and it could end up being quite a costly site to buy, the acquisition cost because it is a high value property. It doesn't need a lot of work, which is basically buying a very big discounted value, but that discounted value gets eaten up by stamp duty and finance costs. So if you don't get the GDV you need, you might be breaking even on quite... And then the issue with the bigger sites is because the debt piece is quite a lot bigger. Every week that it's not selling is chunk, chunking into... The red is is significant. You know, If you're buying a 200 grand house and selling it for 375, the risk is a lot lower. But this is you know almost going to be going for hopefully towards a million. And I, I suppose one sort of eureka moment I had was looking at the, you know, actually saying the timeframes of the two projects in my head. I think we might actually be able to do one cash quickly and then do the, the second one leveraged, which is our most traditional way, rather mm-hmm. than doing one investment and waiting for the second one. And it also yeah. de-risks, so it's kind of like double solution. It de-risks the riskier deal. Uh, and it means that we actually get a higher cash return on his investment and our, our return on time. And then still do the deal number two, and hopefully, obviously, a, a second deal at the same time as the second one. Anyway, um, nice. That was one. Cool. Yeah, I think um, fundamentally, everyone needs a break. Uh, it's not all hustle, hustle, grind, grind. Um, you need to roll your sleeves up when when you have to, um, but you need you need these breaks to reach. I do find that I get a lot of really good ideas when I'm in that zone and zoned out of work day to day. Uh, I've got an apology to make now because <laughs> I said last week that I would uh, run through uh, the brochure for um, our Muswell Hill project. Um, and I haven't prepared for it and I'm not going to talk about it because I want to do it properly. So, um, Christina, make sure that I get this in there next week. And if you tuned in specifically for this, I apologize, but tune in next week again and I will run through our top tips for creating good sales brochures, how to sell faster, types of things that you need to be including within your brochures how we've uh, planned our e-website, uh, how our site hoarding is uh, installed actually on this site. So maybe I'll have some photos of that as well next week. Cool. And then on to why we do these live videos. I've been asked this quite a few times to be fair. And I remember um, Ryan actually, mess- uh, when we were when I took over your spot in the developer club the, the, the month you were away on holiday, um, he was like, what, why do you do them? This was before kind of setting up your, your ground up podcast. And um, it's a valid question. And, and but for us, I think the overarching thing we want to do from this is is bring opportunity. Um, and I think doing things like this, repurposing across various formats is an easy way of using two hours of our time a week that we can then repurpose and spread across lots of other platforms. But fundamentally, we want opportunity to come in, and that's what we're hopefully attracting. And by opportunity, I mean both investment from external investors you know all of our projects um, are generally with external investment so you know, if you're an investor watching this you know, we'd, we'd love to talk to you because fundamentally that's that's one of the main reasons we're doing it um deal flow and um, we get deals come in and opportunities you know speaking of deals i know that jack's been in discussion discussions with harry stevenson clark who, who was tuning in earlier and has donated to our charity so you know it's things like that and opportunities that come about through sharing what we're up to and having people reach out based on something they've seen. I had a very interesting call, and she's probably tuning in. Uh, Shruti, thank you very much for the, for the conversation I had yesterday. But Shruti found us via various platforms. She is an extremely passionate and, and hungry. Um, uh, she's a student at the moment studying, I think, real estate. Um, and she wants to come and work for us. You know, she, she knew more about our business than, than I know um, through tuning into these regularly and gaining loads of knowledge. Um, and we get such good feedback, you know, the, the amount of dross that's out there from various property education platforms um, is staggering, really. Um, I'd love to share this even further because I think the value that people get tuning into us every week is way more than paying 30 grand a year to um, learn how to source deals that don't work and do rent to rent. So, you know, not only are we giving value back from property developer for property developers, um, but I, I think there's a lot of value that we give from a business perspective. So. Why do we do it? Investment, 
opportunities. Um, we like to share value. I think that's fundamentally what, what Jack and I like doing. Um, and it's um, a good use of our time to then repurpose into multiple formats and, and spread the word even further. So that's my take on it, Jack. Yeah, I, I suppose for, for me, there was actually, speaking of eureka moments or aha moments, Ben, there was, there was a turning point for me because I really, really kicked the ass out of physical networking events. Um, there was a period probably between 2015 to 2017, 2018, where I was really making an effort to learn, meet people, sap information of others, sponge information of other people. And the way that I learn best is I'm not I'm dyslexic, so I don't like reading. So I like learning off other people. I like that, that engagement. And rather than having to read a 20-page document about party wall surveying, I can ask someone that's a surveyor, what the most common things that you need to look out for. When they tell me that, I then remember it rather than trying to digest it on paper. So that's the main reason that I would do the networking. And then I started to get a reputation and speaking gigs and attend speaking gigs. And I then started limiting to only go to networking events that I spoke at. And then it starts to get a bit old when you're out once or twice a week. Uh, you get leave the house at 4 p.m. You have to get into the city you get back at midnight and then you've got to get up again at your normal agenda at six o'clock. And if you have two event days back to back, you know, they're, they're 18 hour days and you're away from the office. So you're not getting the work done that you also need to do from a desktop perspective. So one thing that I hugely love about these lives is if I go to a physical event and I speak to, you know, people at an event, there might be between 30 and 50 people there, 50 on a good day. And yes, it is more valuable because you are face to face. But your return on time for that eight-hour window of getting into town and getting back out to town is a really poor return on investment. So if you look at our average views on our videos, it's over 100 views per video. That takes Ben and I about an hour a week to do that. And then obviously, it goes to be edited to then produce further reach that's evergreen. So we record it once, and it's watched over and over again, not by the same people, but by more people. There's no friction. It could get 1,000 views. It could get 100 views by the time of that video. Uh, well, it's never going to reach its ceiling because it's always available for anyone to view. Yes, it might become dated, but it's all about building that personal brand and profile. So that's one of the reasons I love it. We get an average of 100 views. And if you picture 100 people in an audience, that is a lot of touch point of people. That is a really good reach. Uh, our lives don't get as much as our bespoke videos. We've launched a video specifically about labor and it's almost got 10,000 views. Those views do, you know, go viral and there's a lot more thought process that goes into actually editing that video. So YouTube probably pushes it a little bit better as a better produced video as opposed to a live, but we're happy at 100 for live. Obviously, the more the merrier, but I think that's a really good return on investment and time for us as, as people, as directors, because we have limited amounts of time. The most important thing in anything in the world is our time. If you're excited by some of the property developments or investments that we talk about on this show and want to know more about investing £100,000 or more with XP, email info at xpproperty.co.uk to set up a call with one of our team. We can discuss our open investment opportunities and provide you with our track record details showing with complete transparency our historic performance project by project and how you could be part of our growing pipeline of developments. Yeah, nice. It's, it's a key point, actually, where we're, we're sort of piecing it up. And Christina's listening into this because she helps kind of get um, get it converted into audio format and spread out across across there. And we have um, you know at least 150, I think, sort of subscribers on just Spotify. I don't know what we're on on Apple, but um, you know, let us know down below. Rate rate and review. We're always asking for people to do that and share it with, with people. Um, but Christina also gets to know more about our business. Our team gets to know more about our business because they see us, you know, discussing these things and it gives them a really good insight. Um, I'm livid at the moment, just a, a quick rant that um, the reason you're seeing gaming videos on the Homes by Aura YouTube channel over the last two days is that my account has been hacked. So infuriating because we spent six years kind of building that up and we were really pushing it this year and we may may well have to start it again. But my account's been hacked. I've had to change, you know, uh, cancel Amex cards and all this sort of stuff. The, the people that have hacked it seem to now be using our YouTube channel to post hack videos on gaming, on Call of Duty and all these sorts of things. So a bit of a rant, but um, I've certainly learned from this to, to move forward with better security and, and have a real closer knit on password protection, two-factor authentication, 
you know, having vaults for codes and access codes and other sort of stuff. So I'm going to be really hot on that over the next month to kind of make sure that we are completely rock solid across the business. But very frustrating. Um, but uh, yeah, a, a bit of an aside from why we do the live videos, but YouTube relevant anyway. But uh, yeah, I mean, I, I'd, we'd love to know down below kind of what 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 are the top two things in terms of value that you get from these things? You know, why why should we keep doing them? I guess you know we're, we're effectively doing them for for people to learn, like yourself. But you know, there's obviously um, our own agendas as well behind that. But it's it's dual purpose. I'd love to know what the viewers actually think and what you tune in for regularly if you do. So let us know in the comments below. Cool. Another one of Jack's hacks, email hacks. What you got for us? Yeah, so um, I probably will condense this into a video specifically around email hacks, but it's just I was doing some of some uh, smart emailing, you could call it, over the period that I was away, and I just didn't know if you guys out there that spent, you know, the majority of business owners do end up spending a lot of time in their email inbox and spending time going through emails. So even though we hate it, there are ways to improve your time spent in that email inbox. So I'm going to list through a few of those I put, we, well, we probably in XP and Central Suites use Gmail. Uh, I don't know if some of these are transferable uh, with Microsoft, but I think most of them are. And just how, how I use them and how it might be useful for you to think about how you can integrate that into your way of working through emails to improve how much time you spend in your emails. So number one is time. So in, in Gmail, you can actually time when an email sends. I really enjoy using that because I think of the email to send now, but they might not need to receive it till... Uh, you know, next week, for an example, where I've had an example of that is I've um, thought of something that I want to tell, you know, a bank, but I know that I haven't done the work yet. So the images aren't ready. So you can create a Google Drive link, get the email packaged up, send it to them. And then when the emails are available on the Google Drive, you can then upload them at a different time. So the email goes out on a set date, and then you can then infill the, 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 the file at a different time or even at a later date, whatever it may be. So timing emails, I love. We actually let another business down from a perspective they didn't want to work with them anymore. And when they originally got that email, they said it ruined their evening because I sent it at like 6 p.m. So just the final sort of nail in the coffin, I, I timed it to send it at 9 a.m. because I knew that when they read the first email of us saying that we weren't happy with their service, it ruined their evening and I didn't want to do that again. I wanted now to come on and have a good handover. So that's another example of a timed email, but a bit more morbid, I suppose. Filters, this is probably one of my favorites out of all of these, if I'm really honest. So you can set a certain type of email to do a certain thing within your inbox. So I set filters that if they are, for an example, from that particular address, I might still want to see that email, but it filters directly out of my inbox into a subfolder. It's really useful for things that you might want to read, like articles, but you don't want it filling your inbox when you're managing a day-to-day -day business. So for example, Savills and CBRE do marketing reports. I love reading those documents, but I only do it when I have time and I don't want it flooding my email inbox. So I filter that so that it immediately, without me knowing, bypasses my inbox. But I can see it in a subfilter um, there. So then that brings us on to labels. So labels are subfolders or labels or whatever you want to call them, where you can actually manually drag things into those labels. Or, or they, you know, the automated version is obviously they automatically do. But if you've never received an email from that person, how do you know whether to automatically set that rule? So labels is an area where you can drag uh, email over to certain different locations. That's obviously quite an obvious one. CCing others, I find that if you're trying to get stuff out of people, they feel more vulnerably exposed or accountable if you CC in your or their colleagues. So if you're trying to get something from a council, if you're trying to get something from a utility company, if you're trying to get something from you know, someone else in your business, CC and other people because it, it enables you to have a third person to be able to see what's going on. Their accountability is, is then up greater. Templates, this is actually one that I actually really, really enjoy, probably second to the filters, is if I write an email that takes me a lot of time and I think to myself, that's a really good general overview or that's a really good overview of that particular business or for an example a lot of people say to us you know what do you do and i've got actually got a template saved in my uh, in my gmail that's just a summary of everything that we do so it goes i am jack jiggins i've been running several businesses including xp property a property SME development company including url link xp surveys 
central suites, power social, et cetera. And it's a generic email that I can just click, pull it up immediately and send it to anyone I know. Equally to that, when we were letting our business box space in Spencer's Wood, it was the same email that I was sending out to all of these inquiries that I was getting from various locations. And you can save templates. So if you write something that might be useful once again, make sure you save it as a template. We also have a filing system in our business called Dext, where we have an email address that we can send every invoice or receipt to, but it's a different email address for different businesses. So one of my templates is all of the different business uh, email addresses for our filing software. Uh, of course, in some instances, I get our PA to do it, but if I then end up doing it, it's mm-hmm. super, super useful. Personal business. So sometimes you have, so I have a personal email address and a business email address. So if I'm dealing with booking a hotel to go away for the weekend with the missus, it's not going to be in my business inbox and vice versa. You often then sometimes find there is natural overlap. So you might get, uh, you might accidentally quickly book a restaurant uh, and that restaurant booking goes through to your business email address. What I then do is just forward it to my, uh, personal email inbox so that when I'm in a working day, I'm looking at business emails and then I'll check on the li- less important uh, personal stuff that, that you know, I'd, if someone personally wants a really good indication of what we're, you know, I've lost train of thought there after the compliment. Yeah, if you, yeah, if you, if you, you know, per, if people want me personally, they're going to phone call me. They're not going to be emailing me, urgent, Jack, can you call me? Um, they're going to call me. So I know everything in my personal email inbox can literally wait for evenings and weekends. So I sift as much as I can over to there. Um, task URL link, this is a really, really good one for outsourcing or uh, time blocking. So outsourcing is obviously getting someone else to do something. And time blocking is where you put a time in your diary to do a task. What that task might be, might be to deal with an email. If you copy the URL link of that email and put it as the task name. So for an example, uh, the task might be deal with uh, business rates and then there's an email that it actually references to, you can put that URL link in your diary so that it's not an unread email in your inbox and clogging your inbox, and you just get to it when you need to. Obviously, if you want to outsource it, you can outsource it to, for example, I give a PI, a P, uh, my PA the URL link to that email, and then they deal with it. Outsourcing folder is similar to, similar to that, really. There's a folder which has uh, got my PA's name in it, uh, and anything that I think she should be dealing with, I drag that in, from my inbox to the outsource folder. And I have outsource urgent, outsource one week. Uh, and then I also have an unsubscribe folder where they know whether to deal with it immediately or to deal with it within one week so that they can manage their desk. And then the unsubscribe folder is just something I don't want to be subscribed to anymore. And then they can then go through and unsubscribe. And then a little top tip for unsubscribing, there is a website called Unroll Me. If you Go into it, log in, create an account, add your email address. It shows you everything that you're subscribed to within that email, and you can actually click through and unsubscribe to all of them really efficiently from one interface. So if you're having issues with loads of shit that you don't want to be subscribed to from the years of logging into a Wi-Fi in the middle of Milan you know, 18 years ago just to get on the free Wi-Fi, you can actually go through and consolidate those and delete all of those. So yeah, a list, not all, but as most that I could fit in in... I don't know how long that took, but got some bangers, some bangers in there. Um, Harry's got got one as well. Creating quick steps to automatically file an invoice and also forward to Dext, and also mark it as yellow for invoice and green for processed. I mean, these are these are hacks that you know I didn't know existed, and and I need to start implementing really because you know, this automation using AI, using all of these filtering systems, you know, it, it's there to improve your productivity and make you feel superhuman to other people because some people I'm sure will sort of be dealing with Jack and realize and, and, and ask the question like how is he responding so fast or how does he have the time to kind of do all of this we do we do a lot we're very efficient within our business and uh, that's how you can be too Shruti hello <laughs> thanks for tuning in a good speak to you yesterday and uh, we will get back to you cool I mean it, it, we I know we plug this every every week but we really want to share the wealth on this. We are on the road to 2,000 sc- subscribers on YouTube. I really want to get to that 2,000 level as soon as possible. I think we're just under 1,100 at the moment. I'm also going to put some some trackers every 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 week so we can see how we're progressing on that front. And I might do the same for podcast listeners. But um, if you're tuning in on the podcast, do please just share it with just one person. And if you can leave a, a rate us on Spotify and review us on Apple, I would be um, very appreciative. Cool. On to point number seven, and this is all about setting up development tracking for success. So if you um, are a project manager, 
technical manager, site manager, kind of development manager, whatever you are in the business, and you're running a project, these tips will, will hopefully help you. And I had a really good conversation at the board with the developer club on Monday. And this was one of the topics of conversations. And I got to see how everyone else was doing it in the um, in the industry or within the room anyway. And I took away so much good stuff. And this one was from, from Shiro, who actually runs the TDC. He's had this system in place for 10 years, um, and I absolutely loved it. We have a similar system, but it's nowhere near as robust as his. So I'm taking a lot of the ideas from him and uh, creating our own and improving our own process. So when we do a development appraisal, our development appraisal looks looks like this on the right-hand side. We have the breakdown of pre-planning costs, detailed design costs, pre-commencement costs, construction costs, marketing, statutory, SIL, all of the things that go into a development. And it's broken into quite high level, a high level breakdown within our development appraisal. That's fine. And that allows you to appraise a site, make an offer on a site, understand kind of where the costs are allocated. But when you get to actually delivering on those projects, you need a much more robust way of breaking down each individual cost more and cash flowing it into the project. So that when you have drawdowns from your bank, you can tell them exactly how much has been spent against budget, um, what's actually been spent, and then actually what's, you know, if there's overspend, what's needed to complete the project. And that's all really your lenders are going to be interested in. You know, is there enough money in this pot to finish the development? And does the deal still stack up? So at the moment, we use Zero. That's our accounting software, but it's very after the fact and it is very high level and it's too high level. And what I mean by that is our, our breakdown only puts things into those pre-planning, detailed design, pre-commencement, build, sales, marketing. It is very high level to those subhead to those headings. And what I what Shiro's introduced um, and, and has shown me in terms of how he operates it is this grading system or this this prefix system. So A is your purchase, B is your legal and professional. C is your pre-stroke post-construction, you know, D may be construction, E may be sales, marketing, and and all those headings that I just mentioned in our development appraisal are all have a letter against them. So that's the that's the actual headings. Now what he does is then go one step further and have B01, purchase legals, B02, title indemnity insurance, B03, valuation report, and all the items that go into that heading. So basically subheadings for the main headings. And What happens is as you build up your development appraisal with those line items, over the years, he's had 10 years of data now for each of those subheadings to see if he's spent, why has he spent more in architect fees on this project as opposed to this project, or what percentage of um, fees were spent on architects in this project? It might be 2% and it might be 4% in another one. So you're questioning, okay, why is it double? What what, um, reason do we have for that? And we can see very clearly the data between projects. What it also does is allow you to um, clearly kind of track budget versus actuals. So if in zero you have a chart of accounts or a coding system where you've got all of these B1, B2, B3, B5, B7 line items set up as a code within zero, all of your costs and invoices and payments are allocated to that code. Everything is in the right place and you can set up at the start of a project what your budget is for that project. So you take your development appraisal, you put your costings in as a budget against each line item, and then you can more easily track your actual spend throughout the project. Now, we do this in spreadsheets, and I, I completely think you should still be running you know, your spreadsheets in the background for your day-to-day project management. But from an accounting perspective, if you've got all of these codes set up within zero, it's going to help you track um, your budget versus actuals far better, allocate invoices where they should be, and then help your, your sort of understanding and reading of the data on future projects because you've got it all set up in in the right way. So if you're in project management, I'd love to know how you guys do it. I'd love to see any templates um, for how you run your developments, but this is how we are going to be doing it going forward. We're going to have a far greater breakdown of individual subheadings so we can track line items more robustly within our accounting software. Hopefully that made sense. I mean, it's quite a lot to take in, but hopefully it helps a few people. Once I've got the system set up in R0, I'm, I'd be happy to share how I've broken down those subheadings. So if you want a copy of that, just message down below. Cool. Q&As. Stu's got a fantastic 
uh, question for Jack. How do you get your hair to stay so perfectly quiff? Obviously, you know, a joke we, question. We've got three questions and two of them are a joke, yeah. <laughs> I mean, he sees me every morning for the ground up, so he knows I just don't do anything when I get out of the shower. I just push it back and it goes where it is. But the actual joke is I always say to people that don't know me and Stuart that he's my older brother, so uh, maybe I got it in the, it runs in the family. Ryan has written, when I beat you to a thousand units, first, do you promise to give me at least a half decent asset? Another ongoing joke, we had a wager that we, who would get to a, fir- a thousand units first. It's a bit cheaper. Um, when he says decent asset, that I said the winner, basically I said the winner gets has to give the other person a house. And he said, and then I made a joke that that, that would be the only house that he owns that would be worth something because he's up in Darlington. <laughs> uh, so he's just joking as well. But we do have a genuine question, which both of us can answer, which is a general question. What does a day in the life look like for you? Are you what time do you start your day? And what do you typically, what do you, what is your typical daily routine? How do you track your to do's? Um, just interested to know. I'll actually pull up who was that was from because they've actually asked quite a few questions before. Um, but do you want to start, Ben? I crack on. Yeah. So my, I, I've got a three year old <laughs> and another one on the way. So my day will be slightly different to Jack's, I'm sure. So I, I typically get woken up. <laughs> but, but you know at about a half six typically i would say by by lucas coming in um my morning routine is kind of sorting him out showering getting changed and um getting him to nursery at about half seven typically so my day will typically start from about half seven maybe quarter to eight by the time i've sort of got back to the house and sorted myself out um i am typically working till half five uh when lucas comes back and then between half five and probably half seven it's family time you know it's, it's dinner it's playing with him you know asking him how his day's been and um you know, having some fun and um you know, it's one of the my favorite times of the day you know as soon as half five comes along i can't wait to go down and see how his day's been and then um i will probably work in most evenings to be honest um after half seven you know maybe there's some some chit chat with the wife you know she's pregnant at the moment with the second so she's often in bed very very early you know half eight nine o'clock she might be toddling off to bed so from nine o'clock onwards i will normally be at the desk again and yeah putting in a few more hours and one thing i think we touched on last week or maybe i didn't but um i've now started tracking my time and this is the second week that i've been doing that and it's really insightful so i use toggle which is t-o-g-g-l um there's another one called clockify um, but that's actually been really, really interesting to see where my time is spent, how much is family time, how much is work time, how much is XPP time, how much is aura time, how much is XPS time, and what that breaks down into. But that's that's a typical, yeah, typical day for me. Do you use the phone app with Toggle or I use both. Actually, when I've got it on the desktop, I find the desktop one a lot easier to use. Um, but my phone at the moment is linked to my calendar, whereas my desktop isn't. So the great thing about the 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 app is that you if you've got your calendar linked to it you can just like turn a meeting into a, 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 a uh, top entry and then you i've set up all my tags so it's very easy for me to just drop that meeting in say it's xpp general ad- admin maybe give it a brief description and away you go i'm, I'm done yeah. so it is actually I, i've put it off from, from now i know that about two years ago jack sent me a spreadsheet from dorian that he uses to track his time and i just looked at it and just my eyes glazed over it just wasn't user friendly enough for me to even attempt it whereas this app is very intuitive there's a few niggles but generally i've been finding it easy to use and enough that i actually do do it because that was my worry that i'll just get frustrated yeah. with the time it was taking me to do it whereas you know do i you enjoy put time I see the benefits do you put time in your diary to time track every day I, I will typically do it as I'm going most of the time, yeah, or it, yeah. it might come up a five hour block where I don't do anything, but I will then just yeah. go back in and sort of turn meetings into calendar entries and all that sort of stuff. Yeah. But I, I, I found it really, really useful. No, interesting. Cool. Standard day for me. I'm normally up at about 6.30 to 7. I love getting into the office before anyone else is in the office. So our team tend to get in from sort of like 8.30 ish, um, sort of quarter past eight, quarter to nine. So I'm normally up about seven and I'm in the office normally by 7.30. So I've got a good hour where just me time. I'll then obviously work through the day, normally leave the office at about six o'clock, try and go to the gym, which hasn't been happening a lot recently because we've had birthdays and traveling and people over and all sorts. I feel like I've eaten in every restaurant in Henley three times over this summer. I normally go to the gym between six and seven. 
and then uh, obviously eat with the wife between sort of seven thirty and eight thirty. Whoever cooks doesn't do the washing up, so it's normally a race to who can cook. But I love that's what normally that. Kelly because I you know normally get distracted in the office or 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 at the gym. And then, yeah, back watching TV. I, just, I don't really watch any TV. So I like that Kelly can put on what she wants to watch and I'm just on my laptop from then 8.30 till 10-ish. And then, yeah, off to bed uh, and that's it. And I normally go to sleep to a podcast as well. So technically that could be classified as that's some work. further further work. But there you go. Um, nice. That's life. Yeah. Uh, what, what was interesting in my toggle is my, like, I've got a, a product uh, a tracking code called, you know, Netflix stroke tv stroke scrolling just like you know aimlessly scrolling so I'll, um, I'll see how i've done this week compared to last week but it is you know scary how much time you do waste kind of consuming content across those platforms but so you know when you, when you work as hard as we do i think sometimes you just need something that's mind-numbingly <laughs> uh, entertaining just to sort of yeah distract yourself from from things but i'm a bit like you kind of when laura's in the background watching made in chelsea i'm like watching youtube videos on seo marketing and um you know learning things and listening to podcasts and audible and things like that so i i do i do think we generally have done 20 years worth of work in the last six years um because we we 2x everything you know i listen to everything on two times speed or one and a half times speed depending on who's talking um you know i, I watch youtube videos on one and a half two times speed now because i just I, can't, I find everything so slow and my, my brain's now programmed to kind of yeah take, take things in a lot faster yeah, yeah a lot of people a lot of people say how have you found the time to work in three businesses and it's 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 not that we're better at splitting our time it's just we work more hours so mm. yeah. <laughs> whereas the average person might work 35 hours in a business if you'd spend if you do work 70 hours you can do two times that in two different businesses yeah. but those um, 70 hours that we do do we we do at a fast pace and we you know yeah get get information into our brains, I'd say, you know, at that one and a half, sort of two times speed when we're tuning into other things, which I do think you, you wouldn't do straight off the bat, but I think over the years, you kind of go from 1.2 to 1.4 to 1.5. Like when I was playing poker, I would, you know, couldn't dream of playing more than one table. And then by the time I'd got into the flow of things, I could play 12 tables at a time. And you just train your brain to kind of cope with, with more, um, which is a blessing and a curse, I guess. But um it's helped us grow what we've grown over the last six years so how do you track your to-dos i think we're both pretty good at time blocking and i think we've done some pieces on this in the past you know if you look at both our calendars you'll see kind of chunks of 15 minutes half an hour hours of tasks that we need to do at certain times and heather's been great actually over the last couple of weeks since she joined as our our, our executive assistant to help me with that like i saw something drop in earlier that was like oh shit i needed to do that and she's just dropped in a 15 minute task for me to like pay an invoice or um you know, deal with deal with an email and you know that's been brilliant nice good questions keep them coming in things like that um you know it, it's it's great to hear what you guys want to know because we we're all well and good kind of pulling topics together and uh, you know it's, it's relatively easy for us to do that because there's so much going on in our businesses but some of it might not be of interest to anyone. So, you know, if we don't know that, then we just throw it into the agenda. Whereas we'd love to be doing more um, things about questions that you guys are actually um, you know, wanting to know about. So, yeah, yeah I you, forgot you, a very important thing that I do every day, actually, uh, which mm -hmm. is I spend about an hour getting my quiff perfect. Um, <laughs> You've done a grand job today. Really good. <laughs> <laughs> just for Stu. Uh, cool. Very good. Um, Anything else you wanted to end on? No, keep the questions coming. If you if you ask a question for like now between now and next Friday of like actually what you want to see in the next episode, please just put it in. Yeah, somebody's asked, do you ever go and watch the Mighty Henley Hawks? I do go and watch the Henley Hawks. Um, yeah. Yes, indeed, and other. Yeah, you, I've I played for Henley from the age of four, I think, all the way up to adult. Nice. So Very don't cool. play any more though. I'm I'm uh, one of those people that's got probably dodgy knees and hands. I actually quit rugby when I was working on a building site because I realised the two don't go together because you end up going on site with broken fingers and then you do the worst week's worth of work your life. <laughs> but I do get down there and other PM DM me so I know who you are and we can uh, nestle a pint in at the old Henley Hawks ground. 
Nice. Very good. And I think on that note, we'll um, we'll call it a day and see you again on Friday. And keep your donations coming in for our charity kayak. You know, we, we really want to smash that 2K target to start with and then hopefully aim for the, the 10K mark. Nice one. Ambitious. Cheers. Ambitious. Yeah. Bye now. Bye. These live Q&A episodes are all about helping you grow your business and build a property portfolio that provides financial wealth. If you have specific topics that you'd like us to discuss, make sure to comment on the platform you're listening on or email info at xpproperty.co.uk so that we can discuss your topic in future episodes. And if you found these conversations valuable for growing your business, make sure to click that follow button and we'd really love for you to tell just one person about us. Thank you.